Good morning. I want to welcome you to the virtual service of the Antelope Valley Church. A.B. Reach, it's good to have you with us, and I pray that you're edified from our worship this morning. I pray that the songs fill your heart with uh, joy and adoration for God. I pray that our communion would uh, draw you close to the Father and the Son, and that you could uh, commune with them and understand that uh, the body and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin, and it can renew the sense of grace you have in your life. And then I pray that this sermon on happiness and contentment would encourage you. I think our world needs a lot of encouragement right now, and so I've uh, found scriptures that I think will be a blessing to you and encourage you. I, uh, uh, I know that there's power in the Word of God. And this morning, as we look at the Word, I believe that uh, our spirits will be quickened and uh, we will be refreshed. Uh, just one announcement I want to share with you is the good news about our special contribution. We're getting very, very close. We're going to uh, continue to uh, collect through the end of the month. We want to reach our $100,000 goal for special missions for uh, the Baltic Nordic region of the world, as well as Bakersfield, as well as uh, our interns. And so please uh, make that sacrifice, continue your generosity, and uh, let's reach this goal by the end of the month. We're at 88000 $262 right now with 68 donors. So uh, we're very close, less than $12,000 from our goal. So that's very encouraging. Want to make sure that all of you know that our men's retreat was uh, postponed until next spring. We'll get back on our regular schedule, but the camp uh, does not want to hold any uh, retreats this uh, fall. And the women's retreat is still scheduled for uh, in Ventura in uh, the, the October 7th through the 9th. Uh, and so uh, hopefully that won't be uh, postponed as well. But uh, it's great to have you here this morning. Let's say a prayer and ask for God's blessing on our worship. God and Father, we bow before you because you're our great I am. You are everything for this world, everything for us. You've provided for us. You've created us. You've taught us and guided us. You've empowered us with your Holy Spirit. And Father, we claim your promises this morning. We're so grateful for your scriptures that give us life and give us direction and, and make those promises. And we want to be faithful to you. We want to show you reverence and awe today. We want to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, we want to give our hearts over and over fully to you. And we want Jesus to be our Lord. We want to be transformed into his likeness. We want to be true Christians and imitate him in all that we do. And so, Father, bless us and help us. And uh, may we uh, make you pleased this morning. In Christ's holy and sacred name we pray. Amen.
never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down Good morning, everyone. It is time for communion. And, you know, I want to read a story about Jesus. I love to just look at stories uh, that can illuminate for us more clearly what Jesus was like while he was here on earth and his interactions with people and and uh, his heart comes through, his mind comes through. And, you know, I just don't ever want to forget myself. This was this was God on earth and uh, showing us how to how to be, how to live, how to talk to each other, how to care. And so as we as for communion, as we think about the cross and what Jesus has done for us, I want us to read this story. It's in the early chapters of Luke and in Luke chapter six, Jesus had just been up on the mountaintop and given the Sermon on the Mount. So he was tired. You can picture him, a man uh, just like us, but tired after teaching and preaching to a huge group of people coming down off the mountain with his disciples around him. You can just picture it. And in Luke chapter 7, verse 1 through 6, let's read this story. And it says, when Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion's servant, who his, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. Now already, what do we learn about this man, this centurion? A centurion was not a Jew. A centurion was a Roman. He was a soldier, a Roman soldier. And But what's interesting is he had a servant whom he obviously, it says he valued highly. He cared about this uh, man. I'm going to assume it was a man. He cared about him. And... Um, and it says that uh, he uh, asked the elders of the Jews. The centurion knew who to go to. He knew that, okay, these aren't my people. These are, they have a different religion. These, they're not my people. We don't believe the same things. We don't share the same uh, 
common beliefs, but yet he knew who to go to to find Jesus. And he had heard of Jesus and believed in Jesus. And so going on uh, in verse four, it says, when they came to, to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. Now, I think it's just kind of funny that anyone that goes up to Jesus and says, oh, this man deserves for you to come and, you know, do what he's asking. It's just ironic. But, um, but this was a good man, a good centurion. He did love his nation. He built the synagogue. Uh, so Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Amazing again that a centurion would, would think that, would be so humble as to believe that about a Jew. And in verse 7, um, the centurion goes on and he said, That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith, even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. So many little things about this story that are just interesting. Uh, first of all, Jesus wasn't offended uh, when the man asked him to come. When these servants said, come on, our, our master deserves to have you come. Jesus wasn't offended. He just went. And then what I love is that it says Jesus was amazed at the centurion's faith. You know, um, I looked in the, some of the uh, little footnotes and it said that Jesus was only amazed two times in the scriptures. One, because of a person's belief. That's this story. And another time because of someone's unbelief. So, I love it that Jesus was impressed and amazed at this man's faith. And, he, and Jesus says, and he, he's, he's not even from Israel. So, you know, I'm just thinking about, thinking about us and thinking about how we're all doing, how I'm doing. You know, it's still such an uncertain time with this pandemic and um, you know, anytime there are trials and challenges, we can take a hit to our faith. And um, anytime we get out of the habit of just the usual contact with our friends and um, our fellow church members, it, can, we, it just hurts our faith, it can't help but. And so I just was inspired by this to, to impress Jesus with my faith to want to grow in my faith, to like restore my faith to where it was, or even more so. And so as we pray for communion, I just want to encourage you to do the same with me, to strengthen your faith, to desire to, to amaze Jesus with your level of faith, even during a really challenging time uh, such as we're living in right now. So let's pray for communion. God, we love you so much, and we thank you for these glimpses of Jesus in his life, his heart, um, just his personality, even the things that amazed him. Um, and uh, we too are impressed with this centurion's faith, with his understanding of the authority that Jesus had that he received from you. We're so thankful, Father, for your plan of salvation that Jesus came to this earth, that he died for us on the cross, that we can live. Um, please help us to respond to you, to respond to that to that amazing gesture with our own faith, our daily faith. Uh, we love you, Father, and for I, I just pray that we really appreciate the the um, communion that we're about to partake. That we can uh, desire to do better. We can put aside the sins of the past, look forward to a new day, to a better 
uh, to a stronger faith. Um, and I pray that you just forgive us, help us to uh, really live the kind of lives that you want us to live, pleasing Jesus and imitating him on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For contribution, I want to read Matthew chapter 6, 1 through 4. It says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the street to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not left, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. This has always been um, a f um, verses that have not confused me, but I've just wondered, okay, what exactly was Jesus wanting? What message? Did he want us to understand here? And um, all I can think of is that he he does not want us to he, that what is so important, the most important thing, is what we're thinking and feeling, what's going on inside of us when we are giving, when we're helping people. That it should just never be for uh, to impress someone else. Should never be for show. Um, shouldn't be done under any kind of obligation, but but that our hearts and our minds, when we're giving to each other, just really need to be in the right place um, so that we may have our reward in heaven. So it's almost like Jesus is saying, don't even think about it too much. Just do what is right um, because you know what is right. Uh, when he says, don't... Um, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Don't overthink it. Just do the right thing because you love people um, and because my Father's commanded it. And so when we give our contribution today, uh, let's just check our hearts because there are so many needy people around us. They're everywhere. Uh, and they have such great needs. And let's be grateful for what we have. Let's pray for contribution. God, we thank you for all that we have. We have food, clothing, shelter. Help us never to compare ourselves with other people. And when we're tempted to do that, help us to remember that what goes on inside, um, our hearts, our treasures that we've stored up in heaven, our spiritual gifts that we have from you, that is what is lasting. That's what's important. Um, please be with us right now as we give our contribution for the needs of the community and for the church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now there are three ways you can give. Um, you can text to AV Church. 
77977 and follow the prompts. You can write a check, old school fashion, to the AV Church, and there's the address. Or you can go to the website and click the Give tab. Have a great day.
Well, turn your Bibles over to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to begin in verse 10. And we're uh, discussing the secret of happiness. And today we're going to focus in on being content. Learning from the Apostle Paul what it means to be content. There's so many discontent people. And when you're discontent, you take it out on others. And so the more content we are, the more grateful we are, the more peace we have within us, then the more we can be encouraging to others, lift up others, and uh, go through life with a sense of gratitude and contentment that uh, really blesses us and blesses everyone around us. In Philippians 4, beginning in verse 10, it says that outward concern for others, giving to others, looking not only to our own needs, but looking to the needs of others, helps us to be happy. You know, someone always has it worse. And if you're ministering to people that have greater challenges in their life than you do, then it will give you per perspective. It will help you to reframe your situation to not feel as bad. It says in Philippians 4 verse 10, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to just show it. The Philippians concern for the Apostle Paul comforted him. He was in prison. If you're having a down day or down week or down month, go visit someone in the hospital. Go visit somebody uh, in prison. You know, going to a funeral is never our first preference, and yet it does help us to have perspective and just to be grateful to be alive. The secret of happiness is contentment. And an outward focus will fuel that contentment. Amen? And then, going on to the next verse, in verse 11 it says, Happiness is learned. You're not naturally going to be happy. I think a lot of us walk through life and we just think happiness is going to come over as like a rain shower or something. But it needs to be learned. It says in Philippians 4.11, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. The church provided for Paul's needs, and so he expresses his gratitude. And he's learned to be content. Contentment is an inner state. It's a state of mind. It's a state of heart. And you can choose to be content. You can count your blessings, or you can compare yourself to others and look at what you don't have and be discontent. It's better to be content. The next lesson is happiness is a state of mind. What we're thinking and what we're focused on and what our vision is will determine our own happiness. In Philippians 4 verse 12 it says, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Content does not have to to come from our circumstances, but our state of mind. So many people want their circumstances to be different and they won't be content until certain circumstances are fulfilled in their life. That's not what will bring you contentment. It's your own state of mind. You can choose to be content. You can choose to love your job. You can choose to love where you live. You can choose to love the people you're with. It's a state of mind. Contentment is the ability to express joy, whether hungry or well-fed, solvent or insolvent. Some things you're not in control of and you can't do anything about. And you can choose to be happy or you can choose to be sad. And so please choose to be content. Philippians 4 verse 13 tells us the absolute secret of happiness. It says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You know, Christ wants all our cares and burdens. He says, pray, and bring them to me. Leave them at my feet. Cast all your anxieties upon me, for I care for you. And so if we will surrender our worries, our concerns, our discontentment, our anxiety, everything that's bothering us, and give them over to Jesus, then we'll find the secret of happiness. It's in his strength. He will strengthen us. He will fill us 
with his power. The secret of contentment is relying on God for our strength with faith to accomplish anything. You begin to dream and have possibilities. You develop these vision boards and with goals for your life, and you will fulfill them. Hope knows God will bless and assist us. Contentment requires partnership with God. You're not on your own. You have help. You have it, it, cosmic help. The creator of the universe, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. According to Colossians 2, it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. Colossians 1.27 says, this is the mystery that's been revealed. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Some happiness thoughts. Humanists say, I can do anything. Spiritualists say, God can do everything. But a Christian says, we, God and I, can do anything. God wants to partner with us. He wants us to help us to be prosperous and successful, but only through partnership, only through collaboration with the Holy Spirit, being guided by the Spirit, being guided by scriptures. Philippians 4 verse 14 says, we need to share our happiness. The more we give to others, the more happiness will come back to us. Paul says, yet it was good of you to share my troubles. You know, you start praying for other people, you be a Friend with faith to others, it will increase your faith. And God will bless you for giving to others, even when you're hurting. I know that when I'm ministering to others, my cares shrink. And I begin to see the power of God working in their life. And so I am reaffirmed that the power of God will be working in my life. Paul is not alone, even in prison. But he knows he is a partner in the church in Philippi. You know, one thing that will make you happy is focused on happy memories. In Philippians 4, verse 15, it says, Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except only you. So Paul reminisces how the church in Philippi supported them in the early days. He, he's reminded them, remember those good old days? And there's always good memories that you can hold on to and you can capture. The Philippians supported Paul's missionary journeys financially, and it helped to establish and plant churches. And so they had done something eternally significant with their money and with their lives and through Paul. And so Paul's reminding them of that significance. Every missionary needs sponsors or contributors, patrons. Patronage was common in the ancient world, and we need patronage today to get things accomplished for God, to get great things accomplished for God. And helping others brings happiness. According to Philippians 4, verse 16, For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I needed it. Has a gift come out of the blue when you needed it most? Somehow somebody found out a need in your life and they met that need. That's one of the greatest blessings of being a part of the church, a part of the brotherhood of Christ. People do care. It renews your faith in humanity. It renews your faith in the brotherhood. It renews your faith in the church. When out of the blue, somebody meets your need. And if, if somebody knows, they'll meet it. Paul needed the Philippians aid and he expresses his gratitude for their support. Happiness comes back around. According to Philippians 4.17, not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. God knows and Paul knows that whatever we do, and Paul knew and he wants to remind the, the Philippians that if they give, God will recognize it and he'll give to them. Paul always needed financial support. The more support he raised, the less tent making he had to practice. Paul's motive for asking for support was the blessing the givers would receive from God. God blesses you when you give to others. Happiness is a gift from others also. Philippians 4 and verse 18, I have received full payment and have more than enough. I'm amply supplied. Now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They're a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing 
to God. We need to see when we give to others, we're really giving to God, just like Jesus said. When you did this for the least of these, my brothers, you did it for me. God has an, a, a, a heavenly accountant that keeps track of what we give to others so God can bless us. This aid was exceptional. In Philippians 4, verse 19, it says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. This is a promise that Paul expressed to the church because they'd been giving to him. He promised them that God would give back to the church. Happiness is a gift from God. What do these, te these verses teach us about happiness this morning? Happiness is having outward concern for other people. Happiness is learned. Happiness is a state of mind. We need to share our happiness with other people. We can be happy if we focus on happy memories. And helping others, serving others, giving to others brings us happiness. Because what happiness will go around and it will come back around to us. It's a gift to others and it's a gift from God to us. I want each and every one of you to be happy. I want to be happy. And I know it isn't in material things. It isn't in my circumstances. It isn't in my health. It isn't in my bank account. It's in my relationship with God. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Christ in us, the hope of glory. I have learned the secret to be content in any and all circumstances. And that is turning my anxieties and worries and cares over to God, reframing my thinking until I'm focused on heavenly things and spiritual things and not on worldly things. And I accept the gift of happiness that God wants to give me. May you go away from this sermon this morning with a greater sense of joy, a greater sense of internal happiness and contentment. And may we praise God and thank Him for every blessing. Count your blessings. Make a list this week and pray about it and thank God for all the contentment, all the blessings, all the good things in your life. God bless you, church. Love you. Amen.
every day. It's you I live.